Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, the ENT resident. Today, we will have a clinical case discussion on a very important, very common case that we all encounter in both PG as well as under UG. And this case is going to be about chronic suppurative otitis media. So here first, I will be presenting you with the history of the patient. Then we will have a short discussion on the various aspects of the history and uh, like how every point helps you rule out certain diseases, how with the help of history uh, you come to a provisional diagnosis. Then after that, I'll be giving you the clinical examination findings of the patient. We will discuss a few clinical points and then at the end, we will summarize the whole case and we'll come to a provisional diagnosis and how we'll manage the case. So let's begin. So here a patient named Vinod, aged 35 years male, living in Kolkata, Hindu by religion and clerk by occupation, presented with the chief complaint of discharge from ear for 6 months and diminished hearing on the right ear for 4 months. Now here, in, in an earlier video where I discussed how to take history in an ear case, I have mentioned the importance of all these patient particulars that I have taken here. So to know that, refer back to that video. So now we'll come to history of present illness. Now patient is apparently asymptomatic six months back when he started complaining of discharge from the right ear, which was insidious in onset, gradually progressive in nature, is mucopurulent, intermittent, yellowish in color, non-foul smelling, non-blood stained, profuse in quantity and it is aggravated by upper respiratory tract infections and relieved on using medications. Then he is complaining of diminished hearing in the right ear since the past four months which is insidious in onset, gradually progressive in nature initially only to whispers but now to normal conversation as well. He prefers using the left ear for telecommunication and there is no fluctuation in the hearing loss. Now we have to talk about some negative history. As such, you don't write negative history as a heading but in your history of present illness, you have to rule out, you have to present with a lot of negative history which will help you to rule out other causes of this particular disease that you, are you could be suspecting here. Your differential diagnosis basically. So in this case, there has been no history of trauma, ear pain, giddiness, ringing sensation in the ear, fever, headache, neck stiffness, nausea, vomiting, doubling of the vision or blurring of vision, irritability, facial asymmetry, and also there is no history of nose or throat complaints. So all of these could be indicating towards like some intracranial complication that were that that could develop uh, as a uh, in cases of a CSOM or any other inner ear pathology or other pathologies which I'll be discussing in a bit. How each of these points will try to point towards a certain diagnosis. Next, coming to past history. Now the there is no history of diabetes mellitus, hypertension, TB. Thyroid disorders, exanthematous fevers, and there is no history of surgeries in the past. Family history, there is nothing significant. Treatment history, there is a history of usage of ear drops, and the discharge subsided on using those drops. So, a patient is not uh, not able to tell us what is the name of the drops. Coming to personal history, sleep and appetite is normal. Diet is non-vegetarian. Bladder blah blah will normal. And in addiction history, this patient is a chronic smoker for 10 years. So this completes our history portion. So now I will go on to discuss the two chief complaints that the patient has presented to us. One is discharge from right ear and the second one is diminished hearing in the right ear. So first let's discuss each and every point in terms of discharge from right ear. So I said that the patient uh, uh, had discharge from right ear which was insidious in onset. Now, what does uh, insidious in onset point towards? Like it can, it could have been a sudden onset. It could be insidious onset. Now, sudden onset, you will be seeing that on insidious uh, sudden onset will be seen in more cases of acute suppurative otitis media. There will be like sudden increase following an upper respiratory tract infection. There will be a sudden uh, increase in uh, ear discharge from the uh, ear discharge and sudden uh, pain in the ear 
which the patient will come to you with, whereas insidious onset will be more indicative towards CSOM, which develops over a period of time. So, as you see in this case, the patient has developed the disease over a period of six months. Next point. Uh, we'll talk about mucoprolin. Now, he, here we mentioned that the discharge is mucoprolin in nature. So now, when you when I when you when you say that it is mucoprolin in nature, now you have to know what are the different types of ear discharge and where do you see these different types of ear discharge. So, uh, the different types would be there is a serous kind of uh, ear discharge, serosanguinous, watery ear discharge. Mucoid ear discharge, mucopurulent discharge, then there could be purulent discharge. Now, I mentioned to you about the different six different types of ear discharge. So, now we have to find out where do you see these, all these ear discharges, what are the differential diagnoses for each. So, first point is serous. Now, how will the serous ear discharge look like? It will look something like serum, sort of. And this will be seen in seborrheic otitis externa and eczematous otitis externa. Next is serosanguinous ear discharge, meaning that the serum like ear, ear discharge will be slightly blood tinged. This will be seen in seborrheic otitis externa and otomycosis. The third type is a watery type. Watery is what? Like it will be exactly clear fluid water like uh, discharge coming from the ear. This will be seen in CSF otoria cases. Fourth is the mucoid type. Now, mucoid discharge is basically it will be looking whitish. It is acellular. Now, when you suction the discharge in this case, we will be seeing that uh, thin threads of mucin will be coming when you suction the discharge. And whenever the discharge is of the mucoid type, then always, always remember that the discharge is definitely coming from the middle ear. Why am I saying so? The middle ear, its lining epithelium consists of a lot of goblet cells which help in secrete mucin. So if the patient at any point of time is having mucoid discharge, the origin has to be middle ear. Now mucoid discharge is more commonly seen in tuber tympanic type of CSOM, in acute suppurative otitis media and in otitis media with effusion. Next is mucopurulent discharge. Now, mucopurulent discharge is what we saw in our patient over here. So, mucopurulent discharge is when the mucoid discharge that you notice is mixed with pus. And this will be whitish yellow in color. So, even this scenario will be seen in tuber tympanic type of CSOM. But when tuber tympanic CSOM is presenting with a secondary bacterial infection. So, that is the most common cause of mucopurulent ear discharge. Next cause would be tuberculous otitis media. And the last type of ear discharge here is purulent discharge where we see pus-like uh, pus -like discharge which has dead lymphocytes and it is yellowish in color. This will be more pointing towards CSOM atoicoentral type or pharyngitis, mastoiditis, malignant otitis externa, etc. This completes about the ear discharge. Moving on to the next point. Here the patient said that the discharge has been intermittent. So in this respect, either the discharge will be continuous or it will be intermittent. Intermittent could be pointing towards that the uh, disease gets resolved and every time it gets, maybe it gets aggravated by certain, certain scenarios. Like for example, here we spoke about getting aggravated by upper respiratory tract infections. So the discharge gets aggravated and therefore it starts coming in. But again, when you use medication, it subsides. So that is the phase where there is no ear discharge. Hence, the patient may complain to you that it is an intermittent type of ear discharge. So intermittent type of ear discharge will be seen in tuber tympanic type of CSOM. Whereas continuous type of ear discharge is more indicative towards aticoantral type of CSOM. Even though it is not exclusive, it, it is not 100% indicative of uh, at aticoantral type, but it more commonly points towards that. Because aticoantral disease will not be aggravated by upper respiratory tract infections. It will be a continuous disease which, which can only be after... Uh, which only following treatment it can be taken care of. It will not resolve by itself. So that is about a continuous and intermittent discharge. Next point is that the discharge was yellowish in color. 
So at this point, we have to think what are the different colors of the discharge that you will be seeing. So there can be a white colored discharge, which I just mentioned is a mucoid discharge. Second could be a yellowish discharge, which is the purulent kind of discharge. So in this case, we are seeing a purulent kind of discharge or it even could be actually mucopurulent because mucopurulent discharge will be whitish yellow in color. It's sort of very close to each other. There can be a greenish discharge which will be seen in any pseudomonas infection. Um, also then there can be a brownish type of discharge. You'll be seeing brownish discharge in uh, aspergillus fumigatus infection and also in cases of wax in the ESE. When the wax has become a little liquefied, it sometimes seems like a discharge which is brown in color. And there can be blackish spores in the ear which will be seen in aspergillus niger infection. So these are the different colors of your discharge that you can see. Next point here, the discharge was non-foul smelling. So what does foul smelling discharge indicate? And where do you see it most commonly? You will be seeing foul smelling your discharge in CSOM, articoantral type of disease. And why is there a foul smelling discharge? What particular smell do you get? You, you will get a fishy odor in this, these cases. It is a very typical smell that patients will be complaining to you about. And why does foul smelling happen? Because of two reasons. First, you will see that uh, articoantral disease will have bony erosion. And secondly, they will have infection with saprophytic bacteria. So, therefore, you will be seeing that these cases will complain of a fishy odor. So is articoantral disease the only place where you get foul smelling discharge? No, that's absolutely not the case. So you may find foul smelling discharge in tuber tympanic CSOM if it has been infected with E. coli or proteus, which is a little bit rare, like with proteus, it is rare. Second, a long-standing foreign body in the external auditory canal, a neglected foreign body which has been there for a long time. Third, you can see it in external auditory canal cholesteatoma. And fourth, you can also see it in rare cases of keratosis obturans. But the most, most common cause of foul smelling ear discharge would be an articoantral type of CSOM. So here, since it is non-foul smelling, it is pointing more towards tuber tympanic CSOM. Coming to next point, the patient said that the, uh, that the discharge is non-blood stained. Now, what is the importance of this blood in a uh, blood coming with your discharge? Now, this can be of two types. One can be that the discharge is blood stained, or second, the patient can say that there is frank blood coming from the ear. Now, both of these will have a different set of causes. Frank blood means direct a lot of blood coming on directly, but blood stained will be. Primarily, it's the discharge coming, but it is slightly blood tinged or blood stained. So, frank blood in the discharge can be seen in cases of trauma or like polyp, glomus tumor, foreign body in the ear, otitis externa hemorrhagica, malignancy cases, granular meningitis. Whereas, blood stained discharge will be seen in articoantral type of CSOM. This is the most common in polyp, malignancies, and granulation tissues. Next, coming to quantity of the discharge. Like here, the patient has said it is profuse in quantity. Now, how do you ask patient about the quantity? How will they measure it and tell you? So, you ask the patient whether like how much discharge is coming when he sleeps on, sleeps on the bed. So, if the patient says that on sleeping on the pillow, the pillow gets completely wet or the bed gets completely wet. In that case, that the discharge is profuse. This will be seen in tuber tympanic type of CSOM. Moderate discharge is when the discharge is not wetting the pillow, it remains within the ESE. So you are able to, like you can, if you put a finger in there, you may be able to get some discharge trickling out, some little bit discharge you will be getting. So that is a moderate kind of ear discharge. This again is also seen in tuber tympanic type of CSOM. Third type is a scanty type. Here, only when you put a tip of the swab stick inside the ear, it will get stained with discharge. Otherwise, you'll not be able to see it in the EAC or the conca or anywhere else. This is seen in articoantral type of CSOM. 
So why do we see atecoantral CSOM presenting with a scanty discharge? And why is a tuber tympanic type presenting with a profuse or a moderate type? That's because the, the, the lining epithelium differs in both the regions. The lining epithelium in the middle layer cleft where middle layer cavity from where uh, tuber tympanic disease arises, it is lined with a lot of goblet cells. There's a lot of thick secretions coming. Whereas the attic is lined with low cuboidal epithelium with no goblet cells. Hence, in these cases, there will be very scanty discharge. Next, we come to aggravating factors. So here we have mentioned that it has got aggravated by upper respiratory tract infections. So what does that indicate? That means in an upper respiratory tract infection, the infection passes from the eustachian tube to the middle ear and it will be exacerbate the discharge coming from the ear. This is seen in cases of tuber tympanic type of CSOM. And then there's a relieving factor that it gets relieved on using medications that again points towards that the upper respiratory tract infection is taken care of with medication and the ear discharge subsides. Now, as we are talking about ear discharge, I want to ask you a few signs. What is a reservoir sign? The reservoir sign is when there is discharge in your external auditory canal and you are suctioning the ear discharge and making it clean and right after suctioning the ear gets filled up with discharge again that is called as the reservoir sign you will see this sign in coalescent mastoiditis and in operated mastoid cavity with secondary infections next what is lighthouse sign now lighthouse sign where is it seen it is seen in acute suppurative otitis media in the stage of resolution. What is this? This is when there is a pinhole perforation in the tympanic membrane and pus or discharge is coming out of that in the eardrum in the acute stage with reflection of external light beam. Here you can see that here the discharge is coming out so there will be a pinhole perforation in the tympanic membrane and as it comes out the external light beam is reflected on top of it. You can see the shiny part over here. This is known as lighthouse sign and it is seen in the stage of resolution in acute suppurative otitis media. This completes our first chief complaint which is discharge from the right ear. Now we move on to the second complaint which is diminished hearing in the right ear. So first we have mentioned that the, the patient complained of insidious onset diminished hearing. Now what does onset of hearing loss indicate towards? you will be seeing insidious onset in diseases like CSOM or press bioacusis where there is age-related hearing loss that happens over a period of time. CSOM is a chronic disease also that happens over a period of time. Acoustic neuroma, otosclerosis or in some cases of noise-induced hearing loss if there is continuous exposure of noise in those cases. But noise-induced hearing loss can also be under a sudden onset following a uh, huge exposure to very loud noise that is known as acoustic trauma. So sudden onset can be seen in viral diseases, fracture of temporal bone, acoustic trauma or any other vascular cause. Next coming to side of hearing loss is the unilateral involvement or bilateral involvement. Unilateral hearing loss will be seen more commonly in CSOM, herpes zoster, oticus, acoustic neuroma. Bilateral hearing loss will be seen in press bioacusis, which is basically age-related sensory neural hearing loss, which occurs with age, menias disease, otosclerosis, and even noise-induced hearing loss. So this is the importance of knowing the side of the hearing loss. Next, we come to that the patient complained of initially diminished hearing only to whispers, but now to normal conversation as well. So you have to like from the history you have to quantify how much the ear, ear, the diminished hearing how much has it reduced. So how do you ask that what, what questions do you ask the patient to assess the degree of the hearing loss you will be asking things like whether the patients is, are able to hear the whispers or whether the patient is able to hear spoken speech, doorbell, loud sounds, loud sounds how much of diminished hearing is there would be assessed from asking these questions. Next point in history is that the hearing loss 
there has no fluctuation now when do you see fluctuating hearing loss fluctuating hearing loss will be seen most commonly in secretory otitis media followed by meniere's disease perilymph fistula and lermoy's disease so these are the causes of fluctuating hearing loss this finishes up most of the parts of the diminished hearing now from the basis of history how will you differentiate whether the patient has sensory neural hearing loss or conductive hearing loss you cannot do any test here you cannot do uh, you cannot do any pyotron audiogram or anything else i cannot do basic tuning fork tests as well how do you differentiate so when you ask the patient like you have to look for their ability to comprehend speech in conductive hearing loss you will be seeing that the patient's ability to comprehend the speech is the same it is not reduced if you raise your voice and talk to him then your patient will be able to hear better whereas in sensory neural hearing loss the ability to comprehend speech reduces as a result of which even if you raise your voice and speak the patient will be able to hear the voice but will not be able to understand your speech that is called as a reduction in the ability to comprehend speech this is a very important point you should remember you may be asked in your viva about this next we will learn some terms related to hearing loss like auto autophony what is autophony is when it is uh, you can hear your own voice louder in the ear this is seen in secretory otitis media patellus eustachian tube next diplocusis when there is an apparent difference in the pitch of a tone between two ears this will be seen in meniere's disease third is paracusis willisi this is basically when you can hear better in a noisy environment why does this happen this happens because there is a reduction of the masking effect of the background noise and increase in intensity of the voice of the speaker this will be seen in otosclerosis last is recruitment recruitment is when there is a small increase in the intensity of auditory stimulus which causes a lot of discomfort to the listener this will be seen in cochlear pathologies now we move on to all the negative history that i had told you about so these were all the negative history the first one starting with trauma so we rule out trauma because trauma if we're following a case of trauma you could have a temporal bone fracture you could have blood coming out of the ear you could have a traumatic central perforation so if you find a perforation you have to look whether it is a a uh, traumatic per perforation or a perforation due to csom so a traumatic perforation will be having uh, ragged edges like irregular margins of the perforation it will be a little bit blood stained you will be seeing other other signs of trauma in the external auditory canal whereas in a central perforation coming from csom it will have smooth margins there will be no blood stains so this is about trauma next part is ear pain ear pain is when you have to suspect then there must be some complication happening because of csom ear pain will be seen most commonly in acute mastoiditis and even other uh, intracranial infections uh, sorry intracranial complications of the csom next coming to giddiness giddiness will be indicative towards involvement of the inner ear which which may happen in vestibular involvement like labyrinthitis labyrinthitis is a intratemporal complication of csom even in cerebellar abscess which is also intracranial complication of csom you will be seeing cerebellar abscess patients will be presenting with giddiness and loss of balance Th uh, third is a ringing sensation in the ear this again points towards inner ear involvement usually next is fever fever will again point towards a lot of other complications like in brain abscess we will be getting a fever in lateral sinus thrombophlebitis petrocytis acute mastoiditis so uh, while we are discussing this there is a specific name to the type of fever that you get in lateral sinus thrombophlebitis and that particular name is picket fence fever in a little bit i'll show you why it is called a picket fence fever what does it mean exactly 
Next, moving on to headache. Headache will be seen in brain abscess or lateral sinus thrombophlebitis. Neck stiffness will be seen in meningitis. Meningitis patients will have neck rigidity. They'll have a positive Koenig sign and positive Brudzinski sign. Then coming to nausea vomiting. Nausea vomiting will be seen in raised intracranial pressure, labyrinthitis, meningitis, and even changes in vision like diplopia. Diplopia can be seen when there is sixth cranial nerve involvement due to its proximity to the petrous apex. This will be seen in acute petrocytis. So this sixth cranial nerve palsy, you, you, you will see a particular syndrome in petrocytis. What is that syndrome called? That syndrome is called as Gradenigo syndrome. It has a triad of features, which I'll tell you in a little bit. Next, coming to irritability. Irritability will be seen in all patients who are having intracranial complications. Facial asymmetry seen when the facial nerve also gets involved. Like in CSO mitochondrial disease cases, you'll be seeing that the granulation tissue, the cholesteatoma may involve the facial nerve as well, leading to facial nerve palsy. As I told you, the history of trauma to rule out a traumatic central perforation, history of noise exposure and ototoxic drugs because both of them can cause uh, hearing loss due to noise exposure or due to the ototoxic drugs. History of other nose and throat complaints which will help you to know about any predisposing factor to the ear infection. So this is all, these are all the negative histories that we have taken. Now that you have taken all these negative histories, what we realize here is that it helps us to rule out other diseases, complications of CSOM if the patient is presenting with us with any complication and also uh, helping us to diagnose whether there is any nose and throat, um, uh, throat uh, infection at the same time which could be predisposing or any other factor in the nose or throat which could be predisposing to the disease in the ear. So name a triad in ear disease where you see sixth nerve palsy. As I just mentioned, it is a Gradenigo syndrome which you see in petrocytis. The three symptoms here are profuse discharge from the ear, retroorbital pain due to fifth cranial nerve involvement and diplopia due to sixth cranial nerve involvement. Now why does only the fifth and sixth cranial nerve get involved over here? This is because it lies in very close proximity to the petrous apex, which is basically the part which is inflamed or uh, which is used up in petrocytis. As for the fever, I told you that it's a picket fence type of fever. Now, this is what a picket fence looks like. You see peak over here and then it comes down. And then again, it has a peak and then it again comes down. So this is how the fever, the character of the fever is like. And why is that so? This is precisely because of septicemia, often coinciding with the release of septic emboli in the bloodstream. So as and when the septic emboli gets released, there will be a big peak in the fever. And again, when it has been taken out of the bloodstream, uh, then the fever comes down. So fever will be irregular, having one or more peaks a day, is usually accompanied by chills and rigors, profuse sweating following fall of temperature and in between the bouts of fever you'll be seeing the patient is alert with a sense of well-being and uh, this sign will not be vis uh, will not be seen in patients who have received early antibiotics they may not have picket fence type of fever in lateral sinus thrombophlebitis next we move on to the past history now, these are the past histories that we asked about. What is the significance of each of them? Say the patient has diabetes mellitus. This will be more commonly associated with sensory neural hearing loss due to neuropathy, malignant otitis externa. These uh, specific risk factor in uh, malignant otitis externa is a diabetic, uncontrolled diabetic patient. Even otomycosis happens more commonly in diabetic patients. Also, if you are pl uh, planning for surgery for a patient, the sugar levels have to be well controlled before we are able to take up for the case. Next, hypertension. Hypertensive patients will have uh, sensory neural hearing loss as well. Tuberculosis. Now, tuberculosis is a very important uh, disease where it presents with tuberculous otitis media. And what are all the features of tuberculosis in the ear? There will be painless otoria, which does not respond to medication at all. For weeks and weeks, you're continuing antibiotics and usage of drops. But you'll be seeing that the patient uh, is complaining of the discharge not reducing at all despite all medical treatment. Uh, then there will be multiple perforations on the tympanic membrane. Now, why does multiple perforation happen over here? 
So if this is a tympanic membrane, what happens in tuberculosis is multiple tubercles form over the tympanic membrane. And these lead to multiple perforation all over. And eventually, at the end, all of these perforations may join together and coalesce to form a single perforation. So multiple perforation is a very important feature in tuberculosis. Then the pale middle ear mucosa will be seen and also the hearing loss complained of by the patient will be profound and disproportionate between the clinical findings and the pure tone audiometry findings. Thyroid disorders like antithyroid drugs and hypothyroidism can cause some giddiness in patients and exanthematous fevers in an early age group will point more towards necrotizing otitis media. Next, coming to family history. Here, the family history was non-significant. So, what do we look out for in a family history? If there is any history of consanguineous marriage, because these cases, they'll have a higher incident, incidence of congenital deafness. A history of otosclerosis could be running in the family. History of tuberculosis, the diabetes and hypertension. Coming to treatment history. Here, the patient presented with history of usage of ear drops where discharge subsided on using the drops. But he was not able to mention what drops has been used. So, what is the importance of knowing this treatment history is that we have to find out whether any ototoxic ear drops like gentamicin, streptomycin has been used or not. These drugs can cause tinnitus in the patient. Or there is, if there is any history of excessive use of steroid drops, when you use a lot of steroid drops unnecessarily, it can predispose to a secondary infection which is caused by fungus known as otomycosis. Also, we have to find out about any history of oral intake of ototoxic drugs like aminoglycosides. Next, moving on to personal history and addiction history, here we found out that the, uh, that the patient was a chronic smoker. So the importance of the smoking history here is that smoking can hamper the mucosal clearance in CSOM cases. And also, before planning for a surgery, we should ask the patient to stop smoking at least three to four days prior to surgery, if not more. This will help in a better graft uptake for the patient. Now, we move on to the clinical examination. So that was all about history and what are the various points you need to keep in mind and the kinds of questions that you'll be asked in Viva as you start presenting your history. Now, coming to your examination, first we, uh, in the right ear, what we see is pre-auricular area, pinna, post-auricular area is normal, tragal sign is negative, ESC is normal. In the tympanic membrane, we note a small central perforation in the antero-inferior quadrant surrounded by remnant uh, tympanic membrane on all sides. Rest of the pars tensor looks congested, cone of light is absent and pars flaccida is normal. Middle ear mucosa looks normal, mastoid tendon is negative and facial nerve is normal. So here we see this is the central perforation. Coming to the left ear, everything is normal and coming to tympanic membrane, it is normal, pearly white in color. Then we see the cone of light in the anterior inferior quadrant of pars tensor and pars flaccida is normal. Next, we perform tuning fork tests. For the right ear, we see in Rini's test, it comes as negative for 256 and 512 hertz. And it is positive for 1024 hertz. Weber's test is lateralized to the right ear and ABC test is same as examiner. Whereas in the left ear, we see that the Rini's is positive for all three frequencies and uh, ABC test is same as examiner. And the rest of the examination, everything is normal. So this finishes our clinical examination. Now I'll be discussing each part of the clinical examination. Coming to first thing, what do you notice when you first start seeing the ear? The first thing you look at is a preauricular area. And what are you looking for over here? If there is any preauricular sinus, if there is any preauricular lymph node enlargement or any scars, skin tags, etc. Next, we come to look at the pinna. We look for the normal architecture of the pinna, the extent of the pinna. Now coming to extent of the pinna, how do you know the pinna is of the normal size in that particular person? Because from person to person, you'll be seeing that the pin size of pinna varies. So how do you know whether it is a normal size for that particular person? So what you'll have to see is that normally it should extend from the supraorbital margin to the ala of the nose. This is what you have to note for extent of the pinna. Next, in any other pathologies like cauliflower ear or keloid, perichondritis, etc. 
moving on to post auricular area in post auricular area we'll be looking out for any scars in the post auricular region usually post surgeries or any lymph node is noted or not what about the retro auricular groove is it patent or is it obliterated any sinus or fistula seen so uh, in which case will you see the retro auricular groove gets obliterated it will be obliterated in a mastoid abscess case where uh, it not only is it obliterated but the pinna is also pushed downwards and upwards so this is the region of the retro auricular groove and you can see how it has been obliterated next uh, th these are some pictures this is as you can see the post oral scar following surgery this is uh, showing a post oral fistula next what is tragal sign tragal sign is basically when you feel pain on putting pressure on the triggers and what does that indicate it indicates that the patient might be having otitis externa which is basically inflammation of the external auditory canal now what is the other name of tragal sign the other name is circumduction sign next coming to the external auditory canal here you check for any wax or furuncle or any fungal spores or any congestion or otitis externa or diffuse edema whether there is any stenosis or narrowing of the canal so this is a particular appearance which we see in, in otomycosis cases known as a wet newspaper appearance as you can see the picture over here this is a picture of wet newspaper how it looks like that is exactly how it will look like in cases of some cases of otomycosis where the fungus tends to cause the skin epithelium to exfoliate and the ear canal will be become full of a mass which will look exactly like a wet newspaper which is basically consisting of uh, fungus and desquamated squamous epithelium of the ESC this is known as a wet newspaper appearance in otomycosis next coming to colors of the tympanic membrane what are the different colors of tympanic membrane that you can see firstly in a normal case you will see a pearly white or pearly gray in color this is a normal tympanic membrane in the second scenario you can see that uh, this is a bluish tympanic membrane now this bluish tympanic membrane is indicative of hemotympanum next you can see here in this uh, you can see a light pinkish flaming this is known as a flamingo pink appearance also known as the schwartz sign schwartz sign this is seen in in case of an active focus of otosclerosis this is known also known as a flamingo pink appearance next in this picture you can see that there is a reddish mass seen behind an intact tympanic membrane this is known as a sunset sign or sometimes even called as a rising sun appearance which is seen in glomus tumor here you can see chalky white deposits on the tympanic membrane these chalky white deposits are known as tympanosclerosis now next we move on to the different types of uh, tympanic membrane perforation so we can have a central perforation marginal perforation and attic perforation now central perforation is when the per there is a perforation in the pars tensa part and it is surrounded by normal tympanic membrane whereas marginal perforation is also a perforation in the pars tensa but it is not surrounded by normal tympanic membrane on all sides it will destroy a part of the annulus and reach the sulcus tympanicus and in marginal perforation posterior superior marginal perforation is the commonest type seen so if you see in this picture here you can see this is a case of central perforation and you can see that normal tympanic membrane is surrounding the perforation whereas in the second one you can see that one margin the margin over here is uh, where the even the annulus tympanicus has been destroyed this is a marginal perforation whereas an attic perforation is when you see a perforation in the pars flaccida region that is the attic region so these are the three different types of perforation now how do you uh, comment on the perforation according to the size like what is the size you can you can't be measuring the size with a scale over here right so how do you find out like what is the size of the perforation if somebody had to ask you about a rough estimate of it so you call it a small perforation when it involves one quadrant medium when it involves two quadrant large if it is involving three quadrants subtotal if it is involving all four quadrants but it is still surrounded by fibrous annulus and total when it involves all the four quadrants and even annulus involvement is there as well 
So this is classifying tympanic membrane perforation according to size. Now that I told you like this is done on the basis of quadrants. Now how do you divide the tympanic membrane into different quadrants? So for that you have to first a vertical pass a, a vertical line which is passing through the long handle of the malleus. As you can see, this is the long handle of the malleus. So a vertical line passing through the long axis of the handle of malleus. And there is a horizontal line which passes perpendicular to this first line, but passing through the tip of the handle of the malleus. So this is the tip of the handle of the malleus. So as you see, these two lines over here, they divide the tympanic membrane into four quadrants. The anterior superior quadrant, anterior inferior quadrant, posterior inferior quadrant and posterior superior quadrant. So this is how you classify the tympanic membrane perforations into the quadrants. Now why is cone of light seen only in the anterior inferior quadrant? See over here, this is the cone of light as you can see over here, this one. It is always seen in the anterior inferior quadrant. That is because light rays directly focus on the umbo and that part of the tympanic membrane around the umbo lies at right angles to the beam of the light which thus goes facing antero inferiorly. Coming to mastoid tenderness. Now, how do you check the mastoid tenderness? There is a test called the three finger test where you put the middle finger on the Simba Conca and you apply pressure. If there is any tenderness here, it will indicate tenderness over the antrum. So index finger is usually used to apply pressure on the posterior part of the mastoid where tendons will indicate mastoiditis and thumb is used to apply pressure over the tip of the mastoid. Tendons here will indicate mastoid emissary vein thrombophlebitis. And the important point here is that pressure should be applied alternatively in these three regions and not simultaneously. So this is the test you use clinically to check for mastoid tenderness. Now coming to some signs related to mastoid. There are two signs that you need to know about. One is a battle sign and one is Krisinger sign. Now what is battle sign? Battle sign is when you see echimosis over the mastoid region. This usually occurs following trauma and uh, more commonly it is seen in uh, middle cranial fossa fracture. You can see over here this region and which is the most common artery which is involved in middle cranial fossa fracture? It is the middle meningeal artery. Next is the Grissinger sign. Grissinger sign is when you see edema over the post-auricular soft tissue overlying the mastoid process as you can see over here. There is edema over here and this is usually happening because of thrombosis of the mastoid emissary vein. Grissinger sign is seen more commonly in lateral sinus thrombophlebitis. Now we come on to the tuning fork tests. Now when I talked about tuning fork test, I told you we use three different frequencies over here. In the uh, disease tier, we saw that the Rinis came back as negative for 256 and 512 hertz, whereas it was positive for 1024 hertz. So what does that indicate? We all know that Rinis negative usually indicates a conductive hearing loss. Whereas Rinis positive, it's either seen in a normal person or a person with sensory neural hearing loss. And because Weber's test is lateralized to the right ear and right ear in this case is a poorer ear. So what does that indicate? That indicates that this could be a conductive hearing loss. And even ABC test came as to be same as examiner pointing towards conductive hearing loss. So now we have mentioned that, that we have concluded that the patient has a conductive hearing loss. But how do you say how much, what is the degree of hearing loss in this case? Just on the basis of tuning fork tests, like without doing a pure tone audiogram. So next I will teach you how to grade hearing loss from tuning fork tests. So you have to first perform Rennie's test using all the three frequencies. If the Rene is negative with only 256 hertz, that means the patient is having a mild conductive hearing loss of 15 to 30 decibel. If the Rene is negative with both 256 and 512 but positive with 1024, then it, the patient has a moderate conductive hearing loss of about 30 to 40 decibel. If the Rene is negative for all three tuning forks, this will be a severe conductive hearing loss of more than 45 decibels. In this particular case, we found the second scenario. So that means our patient has a moderate conductive hearing loss. 
now a tricky question say uh, you do not have all the three tuning forks which would be the most preferred tuning fork to be used it will be the 512 hertz one this is a very uh, common viva question being asked and why is this the reason that's because of three particular reasons one it uh, this particular frequency lies in the speech frequencies there are less overtones and lastly tone decay is lesser for 512 hertz now where do we get a false negative reni this is also a very favorite question and if you are able to answer this question and the reason behind this then you will get a lot of marks in your viva so false negative reni will be seen in severe unilateral sensory neural hearing loss so as we all know sensory neural hearing loss will have a positive reni but say the patient is having unilateral sensory neural hearing loss which is severe the patient may present with a false negative reni and why will that happen because here the patient will not be able to perceive any sound of tuning fork by air conduction and responds only to bone conduction so this response in bone conduction is actually not from the ear that you are testing it is actually coming from the opposite normal ear which is coming via transcranial transmission of the sound this is the reason behind getting a false negative reni and severe unilateral sensory neural hearing loss another question on tuning fork if you had to choose only one tuning fork test which one would you go for we will go for the weber's test and why is that because it is a more sensitive test why is it more sensitive because weber's test is able to detect hearing loss as minimum as 5 decibel whereas rini's test would require a minimum hearing loss of 15 decibel to show any change next coming to neck examination now oral cavity oropharynx uh, in indirect laryngoscopy nose examination i'm not going to go into details of those right now i'll be discussing it in a relevant case later on now what is the importance of neck examination here first it will help you see whether there is any abscess in the neck developing as a complication of csom second it will help you to see signs of lateral sinus thrombophlebitis in the neck while you examine the internal jugular vein there are two uh, tests that you do one is a tobi ir test and one is a croy peck test third any palpable lymph node in the neck in a temporal bone malignancy case will upstage the disease and this is actually a sign of poor prognosis in case of temporal bone carcinoma so as i was talking about abscesses in the neck related to an ear case the abscess that you uh, need to know uh, is that first of all these abscesses is a basalt abscess a basalt abscess what is basalt abscess here what happens is pus will break out of the thin medial side of the tip of the mastoid this is the tip of the mastoid from its medial end pus breaks out and this will present as a swelling in the upper part of the neck deep to the upper third of the sternocleidomastoid so this is a, the sternocleidomastoid muscle this is where the, the swelling will be presenting like this is known as a basalt abscess second one is a sitelis abscess now what is sitelli abscess where a neck swelling will be seen over the posterior belly of digastric now this is a posterior belly of digastric because what happens here once after breaking of pus in the mastoid tip it will trickle down along the path of the posterior belly of digastric and present with a neck swelling and while we are still discussing this what are the other abscesses you may see in relation with a csom case you can see a post auricular abscess which is the most common abscess this is seen over the mastoid displacing the pinna forwards outwards and downwards second is a zygomatic abscess where a swelling is seen in front of and above the pinna which is associated with edema of the upper eyelid and this usually happens because of infection of the zygomatic ear cells third is a lux abscess which is a uh, abscess which we seen in the deep part of the bony uh, external auditory canal and the last abscess is a parapharyngeal or a retropharyngeal abscess which happens from infection of peritubal cells due to acute coalescent mastoiditis now we will be summarizing the case so so a 35 year old male presented with a chief complaint of discharge from the right ear for 6 months and diminished hearing in the right ear for 4 months now the discharge was insidious onset mucopurulent intermittent nature yellowish 
no foul smell or blood stain, profuse quantity, gets aggravated by URTI and relieved on medication. Whereas diminished hearing in the right ear is insidious in onset initially just for whispers but gradually progressing now to involve normal conversation and there is no fluctuation. On examination, we see a small central perforation in the anterior inferior quadrant surrounded by the remnant TM on all sides in the right ear and the rest of the pars tensa is congested. Tuning fork tests to the right ear reveal a negative Rene for 256 512 hertz and positive Rene for 1024 hertz. Now Weber's is lateralized to the right side and ABC is the same as the examiner. So this is our summary. Now we have to come to a provisional diagnosis. What, what is a provisional diagnosis of here? Now as you can all guess, it is chronic suppurative otitis media. But just saying the word chronic suppurative otitis media is not enough. So how do you mention your provisional diagnosis? We say right-sided inactive mucosal type of chronic suppurative otitis media with moderate conductive hearing loss without any complication. So, if I explain this, because the right side is involved, so you have always have to mention the side of the ear. Inactive. Now, this I'll dis uh, discuss right now in, a, in like two minutes. Before that, mucosal type of CSOM. Why did I not say tubotympanic or aticoantral type? Mucosal type is basically the tubotympanic type and uh, the aticoantral type is called as squamosal type. So the, the terms tubotympanic and aticoantral are no longer being used. It is preferable to use mucosal type of CSOM if you are suspecting tubotympanic type with moderate conductive hearing loss. So I showed you in the Rene's test and all the other tuning fork tests how we came to the conclusion of moderate conductive hearing loss without any complications. Now, in that negative history column where I ex explained you what all the uh, negative history we took, that has helped us rule out any complication that may happen as a result of CSOF. So, this is our provisional diagnosis. There is no doubt regarding this, right? If there's any doubt, just drop me a question and I'll get, get to you with my answer. So, inactive type. Here we mentioned that it is an inactive mucosal type. How do you decide the stage of the discharge? So, there is three stages. One is an active stage where you see that the ear is discharging currently. Second is a quiescent stage where there has been no discharge for one to six months but the ear has the propensity to become active again. An inactive stage where ear has been discharge free for more than six months. So, in this scenario, we have seen that the ear has been discharge free for more than six months. Therefore, we are saying that the patient is in the inactive stage. Next important question is how will you manage the case? Now usually we have a tendency the moment that we are asked the question how to manage the case we just directly jump into the treatment portion which is always wrong and is the reason why you may get less marks in your viva. So always remember management consists of two parts investigation and treatment. So first looking at investigations of this case first we will examine the ear under the microscope. This is known as examination under microscope. Why do we need to do that? To see the perforation on its margin, to see the ossicular chain status and to see the middle ear through the perforation. Second, if the, if the ear discharge is active, in that case we will send the pus for culture sensitivity. We can start our patients on broad spectrum antibiotics but if we do find any pus after culture sensitivity we can change to relevant antibiotics later. Third, we will perform a pure tone audiometry when there is no discharge in the ear. And why do we need to perform pure tone audiometry? First, to know the degree of hearing loss, to know the type of hearing loss, whether it is a sensory neural type or it is a conductive type or is it a mixed type. In cases of a mixed hearing loss, you have to counsel the patient before prior to surgery that the sensory neural hearing component will not be reversed by performing the surgery. You are performing the surgery to take care of the disease and make the ear safe. You cannot reverse the sensory neural hearing component. Third, for documentation for medical legal purposes. And fourthly, to compare a pre-op and post-op audiograms. Next, we perform an extreme mastoid Schuller's view. The purpose here is to see the dural plate if it's a low-lying dural plate, to see the sinus plate if it is anteriorly lying, lying sinus. If both of these are present at the same time, it will be called as a contracted mastoid. 
and you need to know this prior to surgery so that you know the anatomy what you are going into to see the type of pneumatization of the mastoid and to see whether there is any cavity in the mastoid what are the different types of pneumatization you see in mastoid basically three types sclerotic is the this third picture over here as you can see uh, you can see that is completely whitish there are no cells or marrow spaces seen over here this is a sclerotic mastoid second is a diploic mastoid where as you see in this first picture over here that some cells are there are small air cells very less in number and you can see some marrow spaces as well lastly is the cellular mastoid where the air cells are very large and numerous you can see over here the black shadows over here these are all the air cells in the mastoid and as i said we look for a cavity in the mastoid as well now if you do find a cavity what will be your differential diagnosis first is normal physiological variant which is known as mega antrum second which is more commonly seen is actually a cholesteatoma or a post operative cav cavity which you have to ask for any previous surgeries in the patient coalescent mastoiditis and other rare causes like multiple myeloma histiocytosis x now coming to treatment of the case how will you treat the case as since our particular case does not have uh, active discharge so we do not need to go into medical treatment at this point of time but if our pres a case presented with a uh, active stage then we would first start to go for oral toileting we would start the patient on oral antibiotics as well as uh, we will use some topical antibiotic ear drops and we'll also give a nasal uh, some if nasal decongestant is needed depending on some symptoms or also we'll start on antihistaminics following which once the ear has been made dry we will go for tympanoplasty of the right ear now tympanoplasty in itself is a huge topic which i'll be discussing in another video but just to quickly ask one or two questions regarding this which is most commonly asked in your viva what is the difference between meringoplasty and tympanoplasty so sometimes we end up giving an answer like tympanoplasty type 1 is actually meringoplasty but that is not true so meringoplasty is basically when you are grafting the tympanic membrane defect without without is a important word here without any inspection of the ossicular chain so here you are just taking care of the grafting of the tympanic membrane and you are not checking for the ossicular chain status whereas tympanoplasty will involve grafting of the tympanic membrane with inspection of the ossicular chain with or without reconstruction of the middle ear hearing mechanism that is the difference between tympanoplasty and meringoplasty and last question which is the most common graft used in tympanoplasty and why temporalis fascia is the most common graft used and that is because first of all the basal metabolic rate of the graft is very low secondly we can harvest it from the same incision site third the thickness of the uh, temporalis fascia is very similar to that of the tympanic membrane and last of all a large size of the graft can be obtained so these are the reasons we all of us will usually go for temporalis fascia graft now this completes our case discussion if there's any other question you have regarding this please put it in the comment section below and let me know if you have liked my video thank you guys i'll be seeing you in my next class